Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is a very interesting problem that's going to challenge our thinking skills and challenge our ability to remember what we know about our fundamental sorting algorithms, about when we hear keywords like the largest of something or the smallest. How do we think about this, right? It's going to challenge whether we've internalized this stuff. Um, but first, before we get into the question, as always, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel and like this video. Um, I'm wearing a Virginia shirt. I don't go to Virginia. My brother went there, he graduated. Uh, I go to Maryland studying computer science, but just getting that out of the way because this shirt is very orange and large. Yeah. So what this problem asks of us is to find the kth largest item. The array might be sorted or might not be sorted. So here's an example. We have an array, k is two. That means we want the second largest item. The first largest item is the largest item in the array. The nth largest item is the smallest item in the array, which would fall right there. So th that makes sense. And actually, let me write n so for clarity. So the sixth largest element is one, because one is the smallest element, right? So what I want to do is, what I, I want to say that we already know every single thing we need to know for this problem. On this channel, we've covered every single fundamental sorting algorithm. We've covered basically all of the fundamental ones, besides like the nuanced ones. We've covered how to do heaps, how binary heaps work. Um, we've covered how to um, do especially quicksort, which is going to be useful for this problem because of the partitioning scheme quicksort uses. We've already covered how to analyze recursive uh, time complexities, how to analyze recurrence relations and, and solve them using the, the tree method, right? We've seen all of this. We've seen our fundamental alg algorithms. We've seen data structures like heaps. We've seen how to analyze. And what we're going to do is we're going to tie all of that together in this video, which I think this is a very appropriate question to tie it all together. First off, if we're dealing with the largest of something, the smallest of something, if we want to find that, th those kinds of values, immediately we think of sorting. And remember, if we have an array of items or just a sequence of items, and we know nothing about those items, then what we can do is at best a lower bound of n log n. So let's put our time complexities there. I've done this several times and I hope we really internalize these uh, by now. These are like the key time complexities, these key classes of time complexities you'll see. And a really good resource to check out is the big O cheat sheet, that link right there. I think I'll link it below. These are the common time complexities. And if I do any type of sorting, I'm going to immediately fall right there. N log N, that is where I start. So immediately, if I want the kth largest item, I sort it and I do a backwards iteration from the end of the array. That makes sense. So let me demonstrate. Okay, so we have the sorted array here and that's all we do. We have k is two, we start at the end. If it were one, we would just pick that item, the largest item. If it's two, well, we need to move back and then we come to the five, right? So, okay, so bring those back, we hit n log n. So what is the next best thing we can do? Well, I mean, yeah, we're going to get to linear time eventually, but what we can actually do is a heap-based approach. And remember, largest, smallest. We've seen this pattern several, several times. And okay, maybe this might not lead you to the most optimal solution, but this is something to bring up in the interview. As soon as you hear these words, you need to immediately be thinking this and seeing how it can adapt to your problem. So why don't we investigate what kind of heap we're going to use? Okay, so we want to use a heap and our interest is the largest. So I need you to invert this in your brain. If we want the largest items, we want a min heap. If we want the smallest items, we want a max heap. And why, why does this make sense? So this makes sense because if we want the largest items, what do we not care about? We don't care about the smallest items. A min heap gives us access to that. If we want the smallest items, we don't care about the largest items. That's what a max heap helps us with, ejecting those largest items, right? So what we need to see is we want largest, so we go with a min heap. 
So why don't we make a min heap? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through the array, slowly going through it, and we're gonna add an item. And when we hit over capacity, when we have more than K items, we're going to eject the um, item that we don't want. So start at the first item, add it to the heap. We're on to the next item, add it to the heap. We still haven't hit capacity, which is K, which is two. And then we reach that one. So what we need to do is we add one to the heap and then we eject to the smallest item because we're over capacity. So one would get ejected and we advance that, that pointer. And I know what you're thinking. We had the one there and what we could have just done is we could have just peeked to the top of the heap and seen that one is less than the smallest item two. So it has no chance to survive in the heap. It's going to end up being the smallest item that gets ejected, right? Well, actually, yeah, we, we could just do it that way. But anyway, let's just finish up with this approach. That would be the more, the smarter way to do it. Check if this item is already smaller than the smallest item, which is a constant time operation. But let's just keep doing it this way. And I want you to notice, I, I'm, I'm, this isn't really scripted and you're seeing like the thought process. Like you would slowly be like, yeah, I would do it this way, but wait, that has this complexity. Cause if we inserted, we would take logarithmic time, insertion and removal, right? And then you would say, wait, we don't need to do that. We can just use constant time access and just peak the smallest item and see if it even has a chance to stay in the heap if it goes over capacity, right? So that, that's that, and let's just continue it this way. We're gonna throw this approach away anyway. Add the five. We went over capacity, eject the smallest item, which is the two. And then we have the six, add the six, and then eject the smallest item. We went over capacity of two, eject the three. And then we have the, the last item, four, add the four, and eject the smallest item. And again, we would have known that this item had no chance if we had just done a peek. But anyway, we just removed the four. And now we have reached the end. And the item that we want is at the top of the min heap. Well, the theoretical top, depending what kind of implementation is underneath. So we have the five, that's what we wanted. So all along what we were doing was we were making sure that we kept out the smallest items so that only the two largest items would stay. So now we know that the item sitting there at the top is the item that we want. So that is the heap approach. This is what we would think next. We thought sorting, Next we thought heap, because we know when we hear largest, smallest, we think heap. So can we do better than this? And this is what we always get asked. Oh, well, I've said this before, but we've, we always get asked this, can we do better? And it's kind of like a cool little challenge to, you know, beat the algorithm or, you know, do, oh, I don't know what I'm saying. So let's, let's go back to the drawing board and see how we can do better, because these are the time complexities. That is where we stand right now, if you change that n to a k. And the next jump is going to be linear time. And we want to see if we can make that jump. And we're gonna see how we can do that right now. Okay, so what we need to realize is when, whenever we're jumping between a time complexity, we need to understand what is wrong with where we stand right now. Again, cool little animation. What is wrong with what we're doing, and I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong, but the thing is, we're doing more work than we need. In the first case, when we sort every single item, that's essentially finding the final position for every single item, and I can answer the question, what is the first largest, second largest, third largest, I can answer any of those, but what was our original question? Our original question was only for a single thing. What is the kth largest item. Okay, so sorting was too much. Okay, and then we did a little better. With the min heap, we said, okay, only give me the k largest items. Don't give me all of the items in their proper positions so we can access any k, any k number. Only give me the k largest. And we saw that this improved the time complexity because k is often going to be less than n, and that's going to improve our asymptotic, you know, behavior. But the thing is, we're still doing more work than we need to. The original question was, what is the kth largest element? And what we need to realize is that we are doing more work than we need to. And what we really need to do is something that we already know how to do. 
And we covered this on our quick sort video, but the key, key nature of how we solve this in linear time comes down to partitioning. Partitioning is the key thing from quick sort that we need to pull here. And I would highly recommend watch the quick sort video before you watch this, because this will be very confusing unless you deeply, deeply internalize what it means to find a pivot, partition around that pivot, and then return the index of that pivot. If, if that is confusing at all, then I would highly recommend you watch the quick sort video first, which is somewhere on the channel. And that will help you understand this. So first, let's look at the array and see what, what the final positions of these items really are. Okay, so what we need to realize is, what is the relationship between n, k, and where the final item sits? n, and k, and where the final item sits. So what we need to see is, if k is two, k is two, n is six. Six items, second largest element. Where will this item sit? What index will it sit at when everything's said and done, if it were sorted? So you see the indexes right there. You see zero, one, two, three, four, five, right? So where is the second largest item? It's right there. That's clear to us. But I want you to notice what index is the five sitting at. The value we desire, the second largest element is sitting at index four. So, I mean, this should be straightforward to get the index of what we desire. We need to just subtract k from n. I mean, that makes sense because if the array were sorted, the third largest elements would just be three behind the end of the array. And the end of the array can be represented by n, right? That makes sense. So what we do is we say n, n minus what? n minus k will give us that index right there. It will give us the final index of the item that is the, the kth largest item. And this is important to us because what we're going to utilize is quicksort's partitioning scheme, or not, it's not owned by quicksort, right? But it's just the idea of partitioning around a certain pivot element and it's going to allow us to bring this solution to linear time. We'll analyze all the stuff later, the recurrences. And again, I highly suggest look at the quick sort video because I analyze the recurrence there and it'll help you understand the recurrence here because they're a little different. Um, but anyway, so, okay, we've established that relationship, N minus K. And again, I wanna say the code is in the description so you can investigate that as I'm going through this for this solution, but now we know n minus k is the index where the kth largest item sits. So, okay, now we know that. So why don't we go through an example of trying to find this kth largest item and let's see how our decision space needs to change as we partition and evaluate. So just follow me, this is a little confusing, but we're gonna start with an example. We're gonna have a left bound and we're gonna have a right bound. And what we're going to do is, we're going to pick a pivot value. The pivot can be anything. It can be the last item, the first item, and well, we don't wanna choose a bad pivot. A bad pivot is the largest item or the smallest item, for reasons I explained in the other video on quicksort. We, we wanna choose a pivot randomly. In the code, it's done randomly in the description. So why don't we choose the three as the pivot? So the pivot value is three. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna partition the space around the pivot. So swap the pivot into the right boundary so we don't mess around with this value. So swap the three, this value, the pivot we just chose at that index with the right boundary, get it out of the way. And so where our partitioning will happen is from the left bound all the way to R minus one. We won't touch R because that's our, our pivot sitting over there. Our pivot value, we pushed it out of the way so that we can do our partitioning over here so that it doesn't get in the way of anything, right? So we're going to iterate from here to there and we're gonna keep track of where the lesser items, the tail of the items less than the pivot um, lies, where that exists. So. What we're gonna do is we're going to place a pointer there. We'll just call it i, and then we'll have an iteration variable j. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, do a comparison. See if this item is, is less than the pivot. 
If it's less than the pivot, then we know we want to move it to the tail of the items lesser than the pivot because we want to section things off. Okay, so this is roughly how this is gonna go. Again, code in the description. I might mess this up as I often do, but I and J. So is the item at J less than the pivot? It's not. So that means we just advance J. There's nothing we need to move to I. So is the item two less than the pivot, three? Yes, it is. So swap it into the section of items less than the pivot. The tail of that list is represented by I. Swap I and J. And we advance the tail of the list and we also need to advance J. Okay, and then, oh, I know. Okay, so now we compare the item at J which is, J is iterating, it's scanning. It's scanning to see items it can throw back to I, which is keeping the segment of items less than the pivot. So, okay, one is less than three. So it deserves to be in the section less than the pivot. So move it to I, which it, it, it's, it, it signifies that section, the end of that section of items less than the pivot. That's what I signifies. So throw the one back into that section. That's where it should be, it's less than the pivot. So swap I and J, and we advanced I and J. So is the item at J less than the pivot? Five, it's not less than three, advance J. Is six less than the pivot? Six is not less than the pivot, advance J. And as we see, we hit the boundary and J has no more items to hit. And we see I kept, I kept the tail. And that's important because what do we swap into the tail of the items less than the pivot. We swap the four and the three, the right boundary where we kept the pivot safe. We kept it safe over there. We swap it with the tail of this list and watch what happens. So this is the, the deep, deep, deep understanding I want you to take away. We covered this in the quick store video, but what we see here is these are less than the pivot. Remember what I was saying? We were generating a section less than the pivot, keeping the tail of it. These items are more than the pivot by default because those just get pushed away because we're throwing back these lesser, lesser items. And we sandwich, we sandwich the pivot item between these two sections. And I want you to notice where three is sitting. Three is sitting in the final position in its sorted arrangement. So notice, if this were sorted, we go one, two, three, four, five, right? Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. I put a box around three because three is in its final position. And this is important because remember what we got here. We said the kth largest element, k is two in this case, the kth largest element must be at index four. We found that our pivot item ended up at index zero, one, two. So, where can the kth largest item be? Can it be in this left partition or will it be in the right partition, the items more? And we immediately see it is impossible for the kth largest item to be in the lesser partition. We have effectively eliminated half of the search space. And on average, if we pick a good pivot, on average, we're going to eliminate half of the space. We might not do it sometimes, we might do it other times, but on average, if a, we have a truly random pivot, we are going to be eliminating half of the search space. And this is what we just did. Our new search space is one past the pivot because that item we throw it away, it can't be the kth largest, and we keep our right boundary the same. So again, I highly, highly, highly encourage, if you wanna see the strict rules, look at the code in the description. But this is the overarching principle behind the concept. Continue, it's almost like a binary search. You know how you do a binary search and you're like, if this item's greater, then I wanna go to the left because I, we overshot in value. If this item's less, we undershot in value. This is exactly the same thing. We undershot in the index that the item must exist in. And that allows us to effectively reduce, again, on average, reduce the search space in half. So this, this is more effective. We're gonna analyze this. But the reason this is more effective is we're going to get to exactly what we want with much less wasted work. 
And yes, if we do partitioning like this and we choose bad pivots, we have an n squared runtime in the worst case, but that only happens when we choose the largest or smallest item in the partitioning space. And that is very, very unlikely to happen when we have large, large inputs. When we have very large inputs, it's very unlikely we're going to pick a pivot that causes that splitting to happen as badly as it could happen. So on average, we're going to have, well, we'll see the runtime, but on average, we'll have the runtime we're about to calculate. So let's calculate the runtime right now. And by the way, I don't have notes for this. I'm literally doing this on the fly. So if I make a mistake, there'll be something in the description, but I hope I don't make a mistake. But anyway, let, let's analyze what we just did. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're gonna draw a recurrence and then analyze it using our, our tree method that we always use. So T of N. So we need to think back. We're going to make another call to our function. The, the, the amount of work we do for an input size N is going to be, we're gonna call the function again. On what size of input though? Well, we said on average we'll cut it in half. So we can just put N over two. And again, this is probably gonna be a really loose analysis, but imagine if you're just like in the interview on the fly and you need to do this. I don't know if you'd wanna go this rigorous, but I mean, you could if you want to. But okay, we're gonna split our input in half. But how much work are we going to do in the actual level that we need to partition with? So think about this. In the call, we're going to do our partitioning, which is gonna take this many comparisons. Let me write it. N minus one comparisons, Y N minus one. Well, if the length is six and we're going to go from index zero to index four, then we know that we're going to do one less than the length of the array in terms of um, comparisons. Remember, this is the for loop. This is the for loop in our partition. And again, code description, you can see the exact amount of iterations. It's going to be one less than the size of the space that we're partitioning with. And that's going to be one less than the length of the input. So that's the n minus one. So after we do that, we're going to continue searching. And when we continue searching, our search space diminishes by about a half. So that's the call again. With a reduced input size, we make another call. So this is the overarching recurrence. And what we need to do is we need to try to solve this. So let's start with our overarching input size, which is n. We're gonna make another call with the input size of n over two. We're gonna make another call with the size of n over four. We keep cutting in half until we get all the way to zero. I don't know if that's on the screen. So our base case is if we have just one item, we're going to do zero comparisons. So T of one is zero. So what we need to do is we need to generalize the work we do. So at the top level, and again, remember we've done videos on analyzing these trees. There's the merge sort one, which is the best one, I think, because that's the first one we did. And I talk a lot of introductory stuff. Um, we also have the quick sort one. So just saying, anyway, one sub problem at the top level. How many sub problems at the next level? One sub problem. And then the next level, one sub problem. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna see that at the top level, how many comparisons do we do? N minus one. And then at the next level, how many comparisons do we do? We do N over two minus one. Why is it N over two? It's because our input size changed. And that's going to change how many comparisons we do. Remember, I mean, if we had an input size four, cut that in half, we'd have input size two. Two minus one is one. We do one comparison. So next level, N over four minus one, and so on. So our job is to generalize this work. So the amount of work we do, we've already, we already know how to do this generalization, is going to look like this. The generalized work at any level is going to be n over two to the i minus one, where i is the level. And on every level, we'll only have one subproblem, so I don't even need that one. And then the question we need to ask ourselves is how many levels will we have? So we're going to have logarithmic level, uh, amount of levels log, log base two of n, because we keep cutting input in half. And we can only do that how many times? We can only cut the input in half log n times until we get to one, which will yield zero, right? So the depth of this tree will be log n. So what we need to do is we need to do a summation and we can do a summation like so. Again, I'm not going from notes, so I might make a mistake, 
but we can split this summation and it's going to look like this. Okay, so what you now see is, what we did was, we split the summation, we put all the, this n over to the i, brought it over into that guy right there, I'll explain, and then we brought the, the minus one over here. We know how to solve that. So all we do is subtract top bound from lower bound, and then add one, multiply that by the inside number, which is one. All we're saying is, how many iterations do I do? Okay, I know how many iterations. How much work does each iteration count for? One. So what we say is this. That's what that becomes, right? And so now what we need to do is we need to take the guy right here and simplify him. We can just bring the n down. So one over two to the i is the same thing as saying one over two to the i. Well, let me reformat it. You'll see what I mean. We can reformat it like that because if we do one to the i, it's the same thing as just saying having that one because we can multiply one all we want, stays the same. And what we do is we can simplify that using the formula I was talking about and it'll become this. It becomes that by this formula. Um, ignore the details again. So what happens is we have this and then we have a logarithm, one half to log n over this bottom guy. And what we can do is simplify one minus one half to just one half. And then on top, we can distribute that logarithm. So then we'd have one log n over two to the log n. So what that just becomes is one over n because one to the log n is just one. And remember this is log base two. So we have two to the log base two of n. We just reap the n, it becomes one over n. It's like 10.25 PM. This place is about to close at 10.30. I don't even know if this is right, but we're rolling with it. So it becomes one minus one over n over that one half. So we can just multiply the two. We can just actually factor the two out um, because this is a one half on the bottom. And so if we distribute the two n into there, we get this, we get that, and then extract the two again. I have no clue what I'm doing at this point. I'm really rushing. Uh, yeah. So what we see is on average, the amount of comparisons we do is going to be two times n minus one minus log n. Again, if there's something wrong, I'll put it in the teacher's notes because I kind of rushed to do this. This was all in my head and none of this work is checked. So I would not rely on it. But what we see is that n right there. This is linear in runtime. We can upper bound this to linear time because this is the dominating term, the n right here. So that's what's going on right there. That's why the complexity is linear. When we solve the uh, recurrence, this is what happens. We get that, it stays to linear time. And again, this might be wrong by some factors, but the dominating factor is what gives us the answer. It's what tells us that this runs in linear time, asymptotically. So yeah, this is some rushed math and I have to leave this place before they kick me out and get really mad because I told them I'd leave in 20 minutes, 30 minutes ago. So if you have not subscribed, oh, Mike. So if you have not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel, like this video. Um, my goal is to make uh, more videos like this and make this channel really big, really helpful for people so that they can um, study, get the job of their dreams, do that stuff and uh, have a happy life, good life. That's what it's all about here. And um, yeah, that is all. That is this video. Oh, and it's constant space because everything's in place, right? Constant space, constant space, constant space. Yeah. All right, peace.